Okay, namaste. <laughs> so I'm on this crazy tear, huh? What's his latest thing now? He's talking about American Indians doing bondage out in the wilderness to please the great spirit and change your karma. And then there's these Chinese guys. Oh my God, they're Buddhists. Well, what are they doing? Starting to channel energy and stuff like this. And it all involves kind of spooky stuff <laughs> like woo-woo meditation, <laughs> emptiness. So there's a big confusion about it. And so what I thought I would do is um, try to ground it in a description of a typical class. What, it, what would it work? I mean, what would it actually look like? <laughs> what would an actual secret heaven, Damo, Shaolin, Qigong, Iron Shirt <laughs> workshop or a group session look like? Okay, there's, there's two ways to organize the work. One is to have an ongoing local group session, and that's what I prefer. And the other way to organize the work is to have periodic workshops in a central location accessible to a lot of people. Uh, so it's up to time and circumstance, whichever is working in the place and time. Uh, so uh, either a, a steady committed group of people meeting regularly or a um, more kind of part-time group that meets only occasionally, maybe two, three times a year. Uh, I'm open to working with both because the principles are always the same. Okay, how does it work? <laughs> okay, first of all, Everybody gets the conversation, which is basically a uh, recorded conversation with me that all the, the things that are necessary for Tantra are okay. You know, it's like signing the, you know, clicking the uh, OK button at the, at the end of the EULA, right? This is the EULA, end user license agreement. How are we going to use this work? To wake up your lower chakras. That's the specific objective of this work. Okay, so to wake up your lower chakras, we're going to have to do things to them. So you would give permission for that. You'll give permission for nudity, confidentiality, and so many other things, okay? That you're a consenting adult in your whatever jurisdictions matter, and so on. So, once that's out of the way, the next thing is to find a suitable partner. Yes, the group can work with an odd number of people in which case the instructor usually takes a more active role. But in, in the best case, uh, the group is of an equal number, of, I mean, sorry, an even number of partners, so that all uh, the participants have a partner. Now, the external physical sex of the partner should not be a problem. It should not be an issue, but if it is, uh, given the size of the group and the, the mix, the composition of the group, we do our best to match people up to their external physical choice, if that makes them comfortable. If they want to go out there on the edge and experiment, well, we can facilitate that too. <laughs> uh, but really what we're talking about here is not this bag of meat and bones, but energy, chi or prana, chi huh? ko. It's chi kung. Chi is equivalent to prana in every way. So we are cultivating chi. You ever notice the way the Buddha sits? He kind of folds his hands in his lap in a certain way. Why is that? His hands are right at this 
energy organ called the Dantian, which is like a storage battery in a car. Uh, the storage battery has the necessary energy to kickstart the whole thing into motion, right? And even, you know, take it down the road and now that the cars are getting more electric. So the, the idea is the Dantian and the sex chakra control the amount of energy in the whole system. All the other chakras are dependent on them. They're the power plant. They are the, the generator. Okay, so without the uh, development of the lower chakras, the development of the higher chakras is going to be checked, limited by the amount of energy available. And we often see this with people who start a spiritual practice and then poop out after a certain amount of time. Why? They don't have the foundation, the grit, the self-discipline, the determination. Uh, any spiritual practice will work if you do it with enough intensity, with enough intention. Uh, any of them will work. That's why there's 112 different practices in the Vigyan Bhairav Tantra and many more in the Buddha's suttas and so on. All of these practices are great, you know, <laughs> they all work. You, it's up to you the quality that you bring to them. And that quality is limited by the amount of energy available. So one of the first steps on the path, you know, right after establishing right view, I would think, is then to open up these base chakras and get the full amount of energy available. Okay, so that's our objective. That's what we're going into this with, okay? And we're not talking about, this is not family life anymore. This is like ashram life. If people are living outside, if they're not in an actual ashram, then they would sign an agreement that they're going to be um, restricted, sexually restricted to only the people in the ashram for the time of the training and they're not going outside. So that's because we don't want to let uh, any STDs in and we also don't want to let any other energies in. We want to focus on developing the Dantian. Okay, okay, so get down to it. What, is it. what does it actually look like? Okay, let's say it's in an ashram. People will come into the ashram meditation room and remove their clothes if they haven't already, okay? Uh, nudity in the Qigong tradition is one of the best ways for your body to get connected with the air, with the qi in the air around you. Huh? It feels wonderful. Uh, doesn't it like to walk outside on a moonlit night without any clothes on? Doesn't it feel great? Have you ever done it? Oh, man. <laughs> Be careful, you know, take appropriate cautions, do it out in the forest or do it someplace really lonely, you know, and make sure be observant. So once you feel that openness, that I am one with nature, see, there's no definite boundary between I and not I, between self and other. Okay, between object and subject, between you and me, between self and the world, or any of the other dichotomies, going all the way up to the basic duality of the subject and object of consciousness. Subject and object of consciousness is why we are feeling incomplete because we have divided our self, because the self, our self, the self, is the only self that is. There's no need for any other self. And this self is only aware of itself. And, but this self is also everything because everything shows up in it. We're not quite sure why that happens. <laughs> But anyway, it seems to be a very reliable fact of existence, isn't it? The whole world, the universe, God and everybody shows up 
in our awareness, in our consciousness, in our senses. It impinges on our body and we, we feel it. Uh, that's why astrology works, uh, when it works. <laughs> because the person who's practicing it is aware of these energy entanglements, quantum entanglements between different aspects of our personality and the cosmos. It's just natural, you know, everything is connected. I think that's the biggest lesson that people get from entheogens. Oh, okay, so people come in, take off their clothes, <laughs> and the first thing they do is horse stance. You know, not, uh, namaste, sifu, you know, like that, and bow to each other, partners bow to each other. But then they stand by themselves. They do the horse stance, and I'll do the video on horse stance. Real soon, I promise. So they do the horse stance, a certain amount of time, enough to get the chi flowing, 15, 20 minutes, you know. And then they do horse stance partners, partner style. In partner style horse stance, ne kung, huh? I'll show ne kung in all details, don't worry. The two partners come up to each other and do the horse stance together like this, as if facing a mirror. Ideally, the partners should be of approximately equal height. It makes things easier mechanically, but everything can be adjusted, no, not to worry. But the idea is their energy points should all touch. The forehead, the nose, uh, the hands, the chest, the belly, the hips, the knees, the, the feet. All those points should touch. And then they do horse stance, neko, leaning on each other. Achoo! Oh boy, ah, it's so dusty here, I have terrible allergies. They do the horse stance kind of leaning on each other as if you were doing it to a, <coughs> to a mirror. <laughs> I hope I don't break the microphone. Anyway. Whoa. We're going to get into horse stance and all that in the, ne in the next one. Then they sit down. <coughs> After 20 minutes or half an hour of partner horse, horse stance, they sit down in meditation posture. Knees touching, hands touching, and circulate energy. Now, as I said, the partners... External bodies can be of either polarity. That doesn't matter. But when they are circulating energy, the partner with the hands above is circulating the male energy, and the partner with the hands below are cir is circulating the female energy, the feminine energy. <clears throat> they must be rooted in the ground. They must be very grounded to do this. That's why we stand first. Standing is rooting. Uh, it's like stand like a tree, right? Deep. So um, then when you finally sit down and contact the other person, <clears throat> you can flow that energy back and forth. Take turns being male and female or active and passive or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't have to align necessarily with the reproductive sexes. Uh, uh, gender can be fluid. It can even change. So, <laughs> because it's primarily, <laughs> it's primarily psychological, right? <clears throat> What's your archetypes? Who formed you? Who conditioned you? Okay. So then, after sitting, it moves on to massage. And usually, for the purpose of one session, one person will choose to be the active partner and the other the passive partner. Because it takes about two hours to prepare for the massage. It takes about two hours to do the massage. And then it takes another hour and a half to two hours to, uh, for, uh, how can I say, post-session care, after care. Uh, debriefing, 
sharing and all of that. <clears throat> so then, after the massage, and the massage can get erotic. There's no part of the body is off limits. Okay, so the energy exchange, it begins with an energy exchange, it moves into physical contact, and then it moves from there into the uh, ropes and bondage, uh, the uh, sh uh, shibari. The shibari techniques, <coughs> the Native Americans call it something different. You know, every culture calls it something different. But the best known term is the Japanese shibari, kinbaku, using ropes to put a person's body into like a stress position, like yoga. Huh? It's like yoga with ropes, okay? And the positions are held for a much longer time because the ropes support it. You don't have to make any effort to stay in the position. Isn't that nice? Yeah, but what happens when the body is kept in one position for a long time? You get extremely powerful sensations. <clears throat> and the point is to eroticize these sensations based on the energy flows and the contact built up during the massage, the erotic phase of the massage. Okay? And, and, and none of this is aimed at having a conventional orgasm. None of this. It's all on the back burner on slow boil. <laughs> okay, it's tantric to the max. So that means there is no rushing towards the release. It's about enjoying the journey, smelling the flowers on the way. So this can go on for, you know, <laughs> any desired length of time. Um, during, uh, through several different changes of position and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but it, uh, it may or may not end with a uh, sexual climax for one or either or both of the partners. Usually not. Generally, the, uh, the uh, practice of Tantra it keeps the orgasmic fluid separate and that is for transmutation going up the spine okay and there are yoga postures for that there are even bondage yoga postures for that so <laughs> all this can be done you see um, in the case of the male milking out the prostate fluid through the precom to avoid an ejaculatory orgasm and also learning to have multiple energy orgasms which most men, of course, are completely in the dark about. And in the woman's case, also uh, uh, stimulating the reproductive organs to cause a flow of feminine essence, which is very valuable and magical in itself, but which also keeps it from building up and causing too much pressure, which can, you know, turned into various different kinds of psychological problems. <clears throat> so, <laughs> uh, this practice is for both male and female. Uh, it's not really a martial practice per se, but it was carried down through the martial lineages because they needed the energy that you get from this. So, how, <laughs> well, I'm 72 years old, okay? Do I have enough energy? <laughs> I got up at 2.30 this morning and began training, which I do every morning. Why? Because it's just the greatest thing in the world. It feels so good. <laughs> you know, it's much nicer to be in a strong, healthy body than it is to be in a weak uh, or compromised body. So you just generally enjoy life more and then you get into all these really neat relationships. So more on that next time. Tantric relationships. Om Tat Sat. Buddha Sarnai.